Well, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Chris Connolly. I'm an attorney and technologist with the ACLU of Northern California. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is bad and sometimes good tech policy. It's not just a DC thing. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what happens in the states, what happens with local government, you know, your local law enforcement, your state police, your schools and universities, how these people are actually impacting what technology is, how it can be used, how our freedoms and, and rights are affected by their decisions. Uh, what I'm not going to do is try to fit 50 states and everything that happens there into a 20 minute presentation because I've been told I get cut off, Mike is dead in 20 minutes and I'm already coughing so I'm not going to try to yell after that. Um, also because I can only be at one place at once and the hidden message in this is that I can only be at one place and I can't see everything but you guys can be in a lot of places at once and you can help me really understand what's going on and make a difference at the state and local level the same way people have at the national level. But that's my end of the talk sales pitch. So right now I'm just going to give you a quick summary of some of the issues that are coming up in state law with local activity and how they really impact how we use and, and how technology impacts our lives. So again, when we think about tech policy, everyone knows what CISPA and does it, who knows what SOPA is? Who's heard of SOPA? So quite a few people. SOPA was the big Stop Online Privacy Act in DC was going to basically take copyright and give it the authority to take down and, and cripple even more communications, basically broaden the extent, the powers of copyright. Uh, and a lot of people heard about it. And they heard about it because it was happening in DC, because it was a big national issue, because it had the attention of the media, it had the attention of EFF and ACLU and others, and, and it really got a lot of play. And as a result, we had a blackout, there was a lot of activism, and SOPA and PIPA have, at least for the moment, been killed. And that's because these people, you know, everyone knows these people. They're, they're big names, they're our presidents, they're our legislators in Congress in DC, and it's easy to follow what they do. But it's a little harder to follow other people. Probably everyone knows this person as well, but your mayor, your local representative, um, your state senator, they're doing things as well that really impact technology. So a lot of people know what SOPA is. How many people have heard of RCW 961-260? Anyone, anyone, no. So this is a bill in Washington state. Uh, it says, summarizing briefly, that if a person with intent to harass, intimidate, torment, or embarrass another person makes an electronic communication to such person or a third party, anonymously or repeatedly, whether or not a conversation occurs, that is a crime. So that's not just cyberbullying, really targeted things. That's probably this. That's impacting a whole lot of what we think of as freedom of speech, of people's ability to express themselves, of flaming someone online, of maybe her, maybe going online and posting about somebody's failure to fix to patch a known vulnerability, or baiting a scammer from Nigeria, or all sorts of things that are legitimate protected activities that the Washington legislature decided, well, we're going to write this bill in a way that maybe covers that. Shoot. Yes, the bill is RCW 9.61.260. So this is, um, th there's, there's a, uh, some good news about this bill, which is that it's unconstitutional. If you try to apply it to something like this, it, will be, it should be shot down in the courts, and there's a court case going on right now challenging the constitutionality of this bill. Of course, if you're the one who's being charged with a criminal offense for doing this, you have to hire a lawyer, you have to find defense, you have to go through the time and energy to do it, or you avoid it in the first place. So even laws that are clearly unconstitutional that are coming out of states can really impact people. And in a lot of places, the constitutionality is a little bit harder to figure out. And one of the main ones I want to talk about is schools. So how many students do we have in the room right now? Have any students? A handful of students. So schools are a place where you know, the principle we've always embraced is your rights do not end at the schoolhouse gates. You do not surrender your right to free speech. You do not surrender your right to privacy when you walk through the school gates. But a lot of school administrators don't necessarily agree with that. They want the ability to monitor their students. They want to know what they're doing on Facebook. They want to know what they're doing off campus. You know, they make, and they do things that sometimes are incredibly egregious. The, you know, one of the, the worst example I know of uh, was in Pennsylvania, the Lower Marion School District which decided that it was going to issue all of its students uh, laptop computers that were equipped with cameras, that were equipped with software to remotely activate those cameras. Um, the reasoning for that is still a little bit murky, but it was used by people who were monitoring activities, and in fact, one of the school administrators 
tried to punish a student for something that was captured on a camera while he was at home. Of course, then the ACLU and others got involved and said, actually, it's blatantly illegal to do this. There's actually law that says you can't, but again, when the law says you can't, but a school district does it anyhow, there are real impacts here. So, but that, that's, a, that's an egregious example and not the most common one. Much more common is something like students posting on Facebook. So if a student goes on Facebook and says, I hate my classmate, I think she's a jerk, or slightly more colorful language you might see out of a teenager. This is an expression, this is what people do. But schools, in many cases, have taken this idea that if you do it on the internet, it's special, and therefore it has to be controlled, it has to be contained, you don't have the same right to speak on Facebook as you might elsewhere. And so we see school districts that tr try to punish people for making fun of their teacher, or making clearly you know, phony threats about their students. I wish I could just kill so-and-so. You know, this is not an actual threat. This is not a criminal offense. This is not something that the school has any right to do this kind of stuff if it were offline, and yet they're claiming because it's online, because it's special, they have the authority to go in and basically trample on someone's free speech rights in order to control the internet. And that to me is a real concern because our students are learning in their schools, you don't have rights on the internet. What you say can be controlled. What you, you know, what you say, not what you say have consequences. That's something that people absolutely need to learn. But you learn that by saying that, by evolving through society, by in understanding how you interact with people, not by being told you can't make fun of your teacher because she said something stupid yesterday or you'll get suspended because you posted it on Facebook. You know, you could do it to your parents, you could do it to your friends, that's okay, but the internet is special. So that's kind of one of the things that I watch for when I'm looking at state and local things, is the, the cyber exceptionalism. So when you see cyber bullying, when you see cyber threats from a state level, it often means this is something that we already have law to cover, or maybe we don't even bother covering in the real world, but we're going to treat it specially because it's on the internet. And state legislatures don't necessarily understand the internet. They don't think about all the consequences to free speech, to privacy, to individual rights when they do this. So that gives us a real, that, that really raises our concerns and it encourages us to really focus on what are these people doing when they're addressing the internet as something special. Are they as a result crippling what makes it special? Are they making it a forum where you have to think very, very carefully before you can say anything and therefore you might not say anything at all? Are we teaching students that you shouldn't be searching for, for sensitive content at school because it might be monitored? So you can't go on your school computer and search for an LGBT support group or an AA meeting or anything like that because this can be monitored because you're at school and therefore you've given up your privacy rights. These are the kind of things that we see schools do across the country in different cases and it's really a concern. So that's one topic. Another one that, of course, is coming up all over the place is what are people doing with cell phones? Location information. Um, so the ACLU just had a co comprehensive uh, Freedom of Information Act and Public Records Act request across the country asking how different law enforcement agencies demanded information about cell phone locations. How did they go to their local phone carrier, to Verizon, to AT&T and Sprint, to get this information? Um, and the answer was all over the map. Some law enforcement agencies, including actually North Las Vegas, get a search warrant. They say, look, we know this is sensitive information. We go to a judge. We present our, our evidence saying there's actually evidence of a crime here. You know, we're, we're doing our, our job. We're making sure the checks and balances are met, and they get this information. Other law enforcement agencies don't require a search warrant. They just go in and they get a subpoena or they get a court order. Or some of them say their policy is, well, it depends on the situation. We'll figure out what we need to do when it comes up. So this is an area where the Constitution might apply. We just had a big Supreme Court case earlier this year called United States versus Jones, but that was really just about sticking a GPS beeper onto a car. So the courts haven't decided whether the US Constitution requires a search warrant or not. So we're seeing all the local agencies make their own decisions. And it's a case where obviously location information can be extremely sensitive. You know, we see more and more research about what you can glean from someone's location. You can, you know, obtain their, you know, their behavior. You can tell that someone's at DEF CON right now by their location. Um, you can determine their associations. You can determine their interests. You can figure out whether they're going to church every Sunday or not. You can figure out whether they're going to AA meetings that happen to meet every Tuesday or not. There's all sorts of sensitive information in location information, and we want that to be protected, but there isn't a standard and local agencies are making the decisions about how to treat this kind of information.
Uh, there's another cell phone topic I want to touch on very briefly because I'm already halfway out of time, uh, which is data on cell phones. So as everyone here knows, a cell phone or a smartphone is a pocket computer. It happens to have sensors and actuators that let you make calls, but the reality is it's far more than that. It has your contact list, it has your again location information, um, it has all the apps you're running, your browsing history, you know, it may be tracking some of your communications. And there's a very real question about how secure this information is, uh, particularly in the context of arrest. So different law enforcement agencies have claimed that if they arrest someone, they have the right to search your cell phone because it's just like your, your wallet where you might be hiding your drugs or it's just like your backpack where you might be smuggling a gun. This to us is kind of crazy because you're not hiding a gun in your cell phone. Pretty clear. Yes, they're smaller now. It's actually, I guess, probably you can make smaller guns now as well. But for the most part, cell phones are not weapons. They're not you know, containers where you store evidence. They are much, much bigger than that. And law enforcement, local law enforcement agencies are deciding in many cases whether or not they search. And whether they, when they're doing so, it's not always coming up to the national level. It's not always coming up to everyone's attention. It's only happening at local levels. And unless the people who are living locally are paying attention and doing something about this, it tends to continue to happen. So, you know, part of my job, I work for the Institute of Northern California, I work in California. One of my goals is to actually protect this kind of information. And we have a bill that we're passing that would protect location information from demands, uh, from all sorts of things. But other states are doing the same, but they can use support. They can use more people who really care about privacy, who, care, who understand how this information can be used. I'm already getting ahead of myself in my sales pitch, so I'll go back to what I'm looking at. And again, location information. Um, another thing we're seeing a lot more of these days is automated license plate recognition systems. These are cameras with scanners that can read license plates as they drive by. Now, these can be a really good police tool. If you think about, I have a list of stolen cars, and it's a legitimate list of stolen cars, and I just watch for the license plates as they go by, that makes a lot of sense. That's a great tool to actually deter crime and catch criminals. On the other hand, if your idea of what a license plate scanner is, is I watch everyone who goes by, I record their information indefinitely, maybe I sell it to a third party, maybe I stick it in a, da a shared database, because it might be useful later, there's a huge civil liberties issue there because most people drive. Most people's information can be collected while they're driving. They don't know what's happening. They have no way of, of paying attention and opting out of this service system, whatever you want to call it. It's not much of a service to them. Um, the same thing happens for things like toll records. And again, this is a place where states are making these decisions. They decide when they have the system, how do they use it? They decide when they have the system, how long do they retain the information? Do they share it? Are they using it for this purpose only, or are they just kind of keeping it around in case they want it? Is there any kind of access control or auditing? Is there any kind of security on this data? You know, these are important questions because this is sensitive data, and it's things that local groups, local law enforcement, state agencies, these decisions aren't made in D.C., they're being made where you live, unless you live in D.C., in which case they are being made, where they are being made elsewhere too. But. So the issue here, again, is that you know, this is a place where some law enforcement and some states are actually doing good things. So I picked on Washington a little earlier. Washington has a very strong law prohibiting reuse of toll records. So they, have, they delete toll records, they don't allow reuse, they have very good privacy protection. Not many other states follow that. Not, most other states, nothing's in the law. So people decide on their own what they're going to do with that. You know, it's an opportunity to push for better things. Um, and I'm going to hit one last topic that's been on my mind a lot lately, and it's a really good one for DEF CON, I think. So another topic that people have been on, have been talking about lately is Facebook passwords. So when can your employer demand your Facebook password? Can your employer demand your Facebook password? The answer is no. That's a good answer. Um, you know, when can your school demand your access to your Twitter account? If you're an athlete, can they demand that? So there are a lot of states that actually are concerned about this, and they're trying to do good things. And so they want to pass a law, and there are some states that have passed a law that says you can't demand someone's Facebook password. How many people in this room can think of another way to get to a Facebook account without demanding a password? Two ways? Four ways? Yeah, there are a lot of ways. This is a place where lawmakers actually want to do good things, but they don't think like hackers. They don't think like security people. They think about, oh, I've heard this one specific threat model, and I'm going to fix it. And they don't think about, well, what's the issue? The issue is not the password. The issue is the account, the access, the credential, any kind of credential whether it's captured rather than demanded, 
whether, you know, I tell someone to log into their account and then walk away, you know, whether I require them to otherwise disclose their information. You know, you don't have to give me your password, just print out everything on your Facebook account and bring it to me. It's a very, you know, expensive way of doing it, but would be perfectly legal if I can't demand your password. So this is a case where people actually want to do good things. You know, local governments trying to do good things. They're trying to protect privacy. They're trying to, in other cases, promote free speech. But they don't understand the technology. They don't think the way the people at this conference do. They don't really have the grasp of the issues. They don't think like a hacker to do it really, really well. Unless you help. So like I said, I'm really here for a sales pitch. And my pitch to you is basically, how can you think about helping your local law enforcement agency? How can you help your state government? How can you work on these issues in a way that can make a difference, that can help, you know, not just from the DC, from the big internet rallies and SOPA PIPA and everything else. What can you do as an individual to actually engage and, and promote this? And there are a lot of different things you can do. The first one, basically, is just pay attention. As I said, I'm, I'm surveying this because I know some of what goes on in the world. It's my job to pay attention to this. I still miss probably, I, I don't know what percentage I miss. I know enough to know that I miss a whole lot of what happens. You know, I don't know how many places have automated license plate recognition systems. We hope to find out soon, but that's something that's going on. Um, I don't know how many schools have different policies because I don't have the bandwidth to, to police every school. But if it's happening to you, you can help people who care about this. You can help the ACLU, the EFF, uh, for some, uh, Freedom of Information Rights, and I can't remember what FIRE's acronym, but FIRE is a First Amendment and education organization. Um, there are organizations out there who really need eyes and ears on the ground, who can help them figure out what's going on. So that's step one, is you can really pay attention to this and help bring it to other people's attention. Part two is you can actually talk to people. Most people, in a lot of cases, they want to do the right thing. They want to try to make a good law. They want to try, they want to have the right policy. You know, most law enforcement officials are not trying to invade privacy. They're trying to do their job. They want to catch criminals. They want to prevent crime. They want to protect people. When they're doing something with technology that they don't really think through the consequences, you can help them understand. You can actually go to someone who's in law enforcement and say, look, think about what you're doing when you're downloading everything on a, on a cell phone. Is this really helping people trust you, or is it making you seem even more suspicious? Is this building your relationship with the community? Is, is the information you glean going to be beneficial, or is it just going to cause more and more people to refuse to talk to you in the first place? Because they don't want to be any way involved with all of this. So there's a lot going on there that people can learn. Um, and going forward, there's, we are always looking for help. We, the ACLU, we, the EFF, I'm a former EFF intern, I will not really speak for them, but they would help, happily take help as well. Um, other organizations who work in this space, we need help. We don't have, we, ACLU has an affiliate in every state, but some of those affiliates are two or three people. So the more people we have on the ground, the more people we have who are engaged in this, who care about this, who can support the work that we do, okay, who can find ways to really dig deep and you know, dig into the technology, you know, whether it's focusing on one particular technology, you know everything about Stingray devices. Um, st who knows what Stingrays are? You want to hear Stingray? Um, Stingrays are basically fake cell towers. Short version is you set up a, a, a Stingray device near where you think a criminal suspect might be or where you're interested. You can't hear me. All right, sorry, I look up, I lose the mic. Um, so a Stingray device allows, it basically allows you to d make a dummy cell phone tower and thereby capture identifying information and possibly even communications from any cell phone in the vicinity. It's a great way to identify, you know, you don't have to even go through the cell, cell companies and therefore maybe you don't need a warrant or something else. And it's all constitutional. Well, we don't think so, but again, this is something that local law enforcement agencies are often making decisions about. Uh, there's a big story, Gilbert, Arizona decided that they were so excited about Stingrays they wanted to buy one. It's a, half, it's a quarter of a million dollars for a municipality to buy their own device. You know, is this a good use of, of time and money and energy, or is this just invasive? This is something that people don't think about unless you really raise the issue with, you know, local, with your city council, with your local law enforcement, with others. So there's a lot of things that can be done. And, you know, again, there's, I'm scratching the surface. Uh, Different law enforcement agencies are taking DNA evidence and collecting information from anyone who's arrested. If you're not convicted of anything, if you're not even charged with a crime, that still stays in a database. Um, 
There's all sorts of stuff going on with computer searches at the border, which local law enforcement is deciding what they're doing in some cases, as well as obviously the federal agencies. There is a whole lot of stuff going on that your local police, your city council, your state government is making decisions that really impact how technology works. And I'm just here basically to invite you to reach out to us, work with us, find ways to just pay attention. If you see something going on that's crazy, don't just roll your eyes at it. You know, talk to someone, talk to us, talk to EFF, talk to the people doing it. Tell them that, look, you're not really understanding what this technology does. You're not understanding how sensitive this, out, this information is. You need to think about the consequences. We care, and so should you. Um, and if you're interested in that, then I'm glad, I hope you are, because you came here to listen to me. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, please do. You can also stop by our table at, in the vendor area and learn more. And that's all I have. So thank you for coming. Unless there are any questions, because I do have a few minutes. So. I should have said that first. All right, one question. I did not. I was working at our table, and then I went and went and looked at the line, and then I went back to work at the table. Did anyone go there? Then So I, I, I didn't hear that one. Um, you know, I, I think the idea that they don't have the time to organize this when that their primary job is organizing information is suspicious. Um, I'll, I'll give a second example. I talked about our location privacy bill. Um, we, we actually, originally in, in our California bill, we wanted to have phone companies report every year on how many requests for information they got. Um, and, and the CTIA, which is the Telecom Industry Association, wrote us a letter saying, we don't have the time to collect and record information about how many demands we get because we're working night and day with law enforcement to fulfill their demands. First of all, it's kind of suspicious that CTI, or kind of wrong, that CTIA is working for law enforcement and not for us, for their customers, to protect their privacy. The other thing is that we know that part of working for law enforcement is building law enforcement at the end of the day, which means they have a record of every time they build law enforcement. So I think in a lot of cases, you know, the capability to, to reveal that data is there. And, you know, at this, at this federal level, I'm very suspicious that they can't do it. State and local agencies, maybe not, because they may not have designed their systems very well. Again, the security issue, audit logs may not exist. There are lots of things that could be improved at that level that aren't there. Um, but I think at the NSA level, I'm skeptical that they just can't do it. So. Do I have time for one more? Sure. Sorry, can you repeat that? The reference for that, it's uh, SB 1434. It's authored by Senator Mark Leno. All right, time is up, thank you very much.